Hello, everybody. Hi to our regular listeners and new listeners alike. Welcome to the Sophist podcast entitled China Manufacturing Decoded. This is episode 167. And today I'm with Andrew Armenovin, my colleague. Hey, how are you doing, Andrew? Very good, Renat. Thank you. Good to be here. All right. And today we are talking about building a product while keeping the whole customer journey in mind, right? And what does that mean? Basically, that means when you develop a new product, you should probably not focus only on, okay, what is the product? What does it do? And that's it. You know, does it look good? Does it work as they want? That it gives, it gives them the kind of performance they want. This is the product itself, sort of the core of the offer. Of course, you get to nail it, but it's not sufficient in most cases. And we're going to go through sort of the customer journey uh, and the eight blocks uh, that, that make up the customer journey. So basically what it means is that a customer who's going to hopefully buy and use your product and talk about it to others, et cetera, et cetera, has a certain you know, what, what they call the buyer journey, right? For first, you, you if I, I, I want to buy a new car, for example, well, first I'm going to start to think, hey, uh, maybe I need a new car. Oh, what kind of car? Hey, you know, hey, maybe I, I need a station wagon because sometimes I, 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 I bring a lot of things around and it's going to be enough for the friends and the family that are okay. Which ones are good models for me? And then you kind of narrow it down and then you try a few and then, okay, you, you, you decide to buy but then that's not enough. That's not the end of it, right? You, 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 you actually drive it and you use it maybe for a few years and you have quite an experience with the product uh, through usage and through um, maybe maintenance of the, of, 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 of the car. And maybe you're not really happy because of some, some issues that you have and maybe the, the lack of support from the manufacturer, et cetera. And then can you still resell it as a secondhand car for a good price and so on and so forth? Right, so it's not just about the car manufacturer manufacturer putting out the perfect car right now on the day when you go you go on the lot of the of of, of the, um, the dealership right uh, it's it's much more than that, uh, starting from when you start to think, okay, what kind of car do I want, and what you know oh a Toyota would be nice or a Honda or what right um so we're gonna talk about that and why are we talking about it? Because we uh, came upon a nice illustration of that in a book by Tony Fadella. I guess I mentioned it before on, on, on this podcast uh, a few months ago. Uh, but basically, Tony Fadell is someone who uh, worked in a, a number of Silicon Valley jobs, including at Apple as director and I believe VP, uh, following up on the iPhone and before that the iPod. And he's got a lot of interesting insights. And he, he set up a, uh, another hardware company um, that includes, um, you know, electronics and, and, and so on uh, called Nest, N-E-S-T. Uh, it, it's relatively famous. They really uh, went big with that adventure and finally sold it to Google. It's for um, like a smart thermostat at home and, and things like that. Okay. And, Basically, from all this experience, he put together a book that's called Build, B-U-I-L-D, uh, that I generally recommend uh, if you're building a hardware product. But we just want to talk about this concept of the customer journey and uh, that companies that develop a new product basically need to focus on much more than just, hey, what's the product going to look like? How's it going to work? Right? There's much more than that that you need at least to have a plan for and you, you, you need to see things from the customer's shoes, basically, right? Uh, does that sound good? Of course, yeah. Let's, what I suggest is we start from the first block and, and then we just go through the, the eight blocks uh, one by one to really um, illustrate what we mean. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, so uh, the first one is awareness. Okay, so... If I want to change the car first, you know, hey, there's some of the cars out there and hey, some of them are, yeah, I need a lot of space, but some of these nice 
station wagons, they really look nice. Okay, so I don't need to to look like kind of a dork, you know, going around with a really ugly car, uh, very boxy or whatever. Oh, okay, that's interesting, right? <laughs> that's at the awareness stage. Uh, first, if, let's say, for example, Honda want me to buy their um, their nice latest station wagon, I need to kind of be aware that there are some cool station wagons out there and that they and that Honda makes these um, these kinds of station wagons right and this is this is similar and this sometimes is a huge problem actually for companies that develop new products right so let, let's take a few examples if I I, I, I develop um, I don't know maybe a um, an, an insulating kind of thermos bottle like that 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 does thermal insulation because I want to, to sip my tea uh, pretty hot. Maybe I go to Amazon and I search for that, right? Maybe uh, thermal insulation uh, for beverage, something like that. And I'm going to have a bunch of different products come out, right? And how do you want people to be aware of your product? Well, you just have to rank there in Amazon, right? Or in Google, wherever they search, because they know they know that there are insulation bottles, right? That keep your, your beverage warm or cold, right? They know that it's there. They're going to search. And then if you, for example, you optimize nicely to be found in search, uh, wherever it is, right? Uh, for example, in Amazon, then they're going to see it, right? That's the first thing. Then after that, you still need to convince them that it's the right one. You need to be priced properly, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the very first block, at least they get, they got to find you, right? Now, let's take another example. So some people snore, okay? And it's kind of a big problem. But if they don't know, if they don't know there are devices to prevent snoring or to minimize snoring, they're not even going to search for it, right? That's that's a big problem. Because <laughs> if you, you know, if you, if you come up with a really nice device, that really cuts snoring completely within a few days. Okay, that you know, that's great. But if nobody is aware of it, then it's much harder actually to penetrate the market. Uh, how are you going to do? Then you need to maybe run some kinds of advertisement that is extremely expensive. Uh, you need to to find like uh, other ways to to reach your intended audience and so on and so forth. Right. Does that make sense? I mean, it's the very first step, right? If people don't even know about the product. <laughs> well, I think so. um, I think you hit it right on the nose. It, it makes total sense. I mean, if the customer is not aware of the products that you, you have in the line, you know, and, and coming out in, in the market, uh, you're not going to sell hardly any of them uh, or the sales are not going to be huge. So you, you, you said it right. I, I agree totally. You got to do, you got to have a really good marketing plan. And, and you need to be able to, on the search engines, come on top first. You need to advertise if necessarily, if necessary. Yeah, it might cost more, but still, sometimes you need to advertise. Otherwise, there is no uh, awareness to, for some certain products. And then, of course, you know, maybe you got to be present in some of the social medias. Right. Yeah, I, I think you said it right. I agree. Yeah, so for example, you... Uh, you worked at GoPro, right, uh, a few years ago. And in my understanding, I don't know, I haven't studied that company specifically, but in my understanding, their products get to be used um, by some, like, athletes and just people um, so doing course. things that they think are cool, right? And these people, there was a huge wow factor, you know, I can be surfing or whatever, and then I, I I can I can shoot the video and then actually after that I'm proud of some of the stuff I did. I can share it to others, right? And that yeah. sharing and then people say, Whoa, this is really cool. How do you do that? Well, you know, with that GoPro thing. Amazing, right? And it, and then it goes word of mouth kind of thing, or, or or on social media or on YouTube or whatever, right? Uh some of these really cool videos that were shot are shared then other people see that actually it's possible to have some kind of camera attached and it kind of works even when it gets wet and everything, right? So that right. that's a really an excellent way to, to spread awareness of the product. 
that is exactly what happened with GoPro, actually. Uh, the founder mm-hmm. shared some of his experiences with his own camera initially when he invented the mm-hmm. idea. And um, it was really amazing, uh, the response that he received from his uh, to-be future customers. Everyone started understanding uh, the whole product and how it works and the kind of experience they were getting. And then once he actually made the whole idea into a real functioning product, you were, you're right. Uh, the response was pretty much wow, you know, right, right at the beginning, as soon as they were uh, using it. Uh, I think the wow factor is what you're pointing at, right? Yes, yes, right, right. And the, uh, the urge to, to share <laughs> their yes. whatever uh, athletic feed. So that they're really cool moves or whatever, right? Uh, and a lot of our, um, our customers, what I see they do, is they, they go in Facebook, they find some, or, or Instagram or things like that. They find people who have a certain interest. So for example, if they do a, um, an accessory for a camera, then they get to go with amateur photographers or professional photographers, right? But people really with, with an interest in photography. And then they do some advertisements there. And since, since it's, it's not free, at the beginning, they do it maybe to, to learn, to get some feedback, to, to interview people and so on. Uh, but then after that, they have to find a way to make it work, to make the economics work, right? So they need to build some margin right there. And this is, I'm getting a bit long on this first block awareness, but it's so important. I see important. Some, some companies go on uh, Kickstarter or Indiegogo, and then they, they say, well, my full cost of the product uh, landed in the U.S., for example, is going to be uh, 30 U.S. dollar, three zero. And, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to price it at 45. Then I have enough to ship it around because it's really small and I still have a bit of a, a margin and so on. Well, congratulations. You know, you, <laughs> you're you not making any money on your Kickstarter campaign. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, why do you even do it? And then actually when you start to sell it, for example, through Facebook ads, or maybe you need to sell it at $70 to make the economics work, right? Because you still need also to make some extra money to help you develop version two and to um, and, and just to have enough working capital maybe to, to, to go with the next batch that would be maybe uh, larger, you know? So people need to think about that. It's all linked. It's all linked. So, okay, awareness, number one, and maybe the biggest startup killer. Okay, number two, block number two in the customer journey is education. They're not going to just see it and say, oh, this is really cool. Okay, I'm going to buy it. Well, maybe, right? If it's, <laughs> if it's near the cashier in the supermarket and it's a little bit of an impulse buy for five bucks and it's really cool or whatever. Okay, they might do that. Um, just snap the finger and get it, right? But in most cases, there needs to be a way to educate the buyer. Uh, they, need, they, they have some questions. They have some um, reservations or objections in their, their mind. Maybe they want to have access to your website and you know make up their mind that way. Maybe they need to ask some questions if it's more of a B2B product, typically. Maybe they would want to, to have a trial, a demo, and so on and so forth, right? So how do you actually make sure that the questions the, uh, the the potential buyer has in mind are answered properly, right? So that that's the education education one. So for example, if I want to buy a new car, maybe oh, okay, that one that model looks nice, but then I'm going to have some questions. Okay, so how many miles per gallon, and and you know, uh, and and what are the customer reviews, right? What's the, the JD Powers or whatever? Not that it makes any sense. Um, <laughs> don't look at JD Powers. It's very easily gained by, by, <laughs> by car manufacturers. And it's a really, really crappy kind of measurement. But there's usually some kind of review system, right? And, and maybe even, oh, okay, it's been on sale for a while, you know. Um, the, the, does it tend to do well on, on the second-hand uh, market? Oh, and by the way, maybe... Maybe I, sh- if um, 
if reliability is pretty good, maybe I can just buy a second hand that's just maybe 18 months old and it's half the price, right? So I'm going to have a lot of questions and I need to find ways to get these answer, answers to these questions. Now, if it's a if it's a car from a mainstream car manufacturer, etc., there's a lot of documentation out there. But if you come out with your new, cool, I don't know, uh, smart luggage, uh, you know, that's that's new. Okay, that's nice. It's new, but nobody knows anything about it. Well, you are going to have to provide the education. You're going to have to to make some videos. You're going to have to to maybe write some. FAQs, frequently asked questions on your website, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think that, um, as you mentioned about a new and or a product that is completely new and or a kind of product that there are other alternatives and competitors out there. Hmm. So I think it's important for manufacturers to distinguish and um, basically have uh, product differentiation mentioned in either uh, in their website or somewhere. So the customer actually understands that, you know, your product is different. Maybe it's more reliable. Maybe has, like you said, uh, if it's a car has more horsepower. Uh, so mm. yeah, I agree. I, I think that is very important that the customer need to understand and get educated about the specifications of your product, the form factor, uh, the performance, for example, uh, and all of these are important. And you have to share all this information via many different kind of avenues, right? You can share it through websites, uh, social media, email and blogs, and, and maybe even have some kind of uh, a demo in, in the shopping mall, uh, whatever it takes, right. right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And now at the very, very beginning, it might be less important if you go after the early, early innovators, you know, the people who know they are taking a risk, don't really know if it's going to work. But if they think it's really cool and they're really open to, but to, to um, trying something new just because it's new, right? But as soon as you start to go a little bit to the mainstream, you get to have all the education, right? And you, you get to have it in the distribution channels that the mainstream buyer is going to use, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of products. You kind of have to to see it and test it right there before you buy it. Then maybe e-commerce is not the best approach, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so that brings me to uh, block number three, actually, which is related to what I just mentioned, is the acquisition block. Okay, where how are they going to actually buy it, right? And 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 how is it going to be delivered? So if it's going to be e-commerce. Okay, something I saw some of our customers also struggled with. They say, okay, I'm going to, to, to sell it e-commerce. And then they, they don't really think, okay, how is it going to be delivered and what impacts on the, on the price? So maybe the product is a bit, a bit too big to go into a standard uh, FedEx or Amazon or whatever box, and then it goes into the higher category. And suddenly the cost of distribution doubles, right? And that that's really that's really dumb. Actually, that has killed some companies uh, or some products anyway, for sure, right? Mm-hmm. So you need to plan for this in advance. You can't just make it up and okay, let's let's just see whatever you know. Let's put it on the market. Let's not think too much about these things. If if the product is a bit too big, too too uh, too heavy, too something, you you might not be able to deliver it uh, by e-commerce, you know, in in an economical manner. Right, and also, yeah, we, we're talking about distribution channels. Uh, yeah, sometimes you need to have it in maybe specialty specialty stores, etc. If it's a product for people to use outdoor, maybe when they go camping, then maybe uh, maybe it needs to be in 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 the kind of stores that you know campers go and get their 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 gear, right? <laughs> uh, so don't. Don't wing it. This sometimes for certain kinds of products is really um, is is really critical. Also Amazon, right? So some people say, okay, I'm just going to deliver on Amazon. It's the first product, first time, first batch. I'm just going to put it on Amazon. Well, 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 well. Think a little bit. You know, maybe you 
if you're not really sure about reliability, for example, and we'll go back to that later in another one of the, the blocks, but if you don't think of reliability, you put it on Amazon, and it's the first time you get really like customer feedback, you might get a lot of bad reviews. Whereas if you start to, you start the pump, if I may say, um, by selling it on your own website, maybe it's through Shopify or some kind of platform like that. Well, then you will see what the issues are and you can fix it. And then when you get to the point where, yeah, uh, nearly everybody is happy with the product, then you start to sell it on Amazon and you can, you, you can get really good results, but don't, don't burn uh, your, your, your chance at Amazon. If you, if you get an average of maybe two and a half stars with a lot of complaints, I mean, Amazon might even kick you out. Right. So uh, that, that's, yeah, that that's my dumb example, but actually we saw it um, with, a few of our customers. And I think there's another site that producers need to be aware of. Like, Mm. for example, you mentioned Amazon. Yeah, that's true. That could happen. But what about if you didn't know about Amazon's requirements? Let's say you have a product that requires certain uh, compliance uh, Mm. tests done and you need Mm -hmm. to have certain um, compliance documentation before you actually put it on sale in Amazon. Right. And what if you don't know about it and all of a sudden the product is ready to go to market and Amazon says, oh, sorry, uh, no, 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 you can't put any of it in here. And then there it is. Right. You just you know lost a lot of sales because you can't put on online. I mean, that's one model. And then how about the payment yeah. model? A lot of people go with PayPal, but even though PayPal, I think it's a very, very common and wonderful digital process, digital system. But a lot of people still are not used to that yet. And maybe you could set, you could lose some uh, uh, sales just because you didn't do it, for example, Visa or some other more common way of getting payments. Uh, so I think you're right. I mean, you need to think about all of these related mm-hmm. issues and, and make sure you have it all actioned out to the team so that everything's all resolved not only from your partner's point of view, like Amazon, or if it was a car, a car dealership, but uh, also mm-hmm. from customer point of view, how does a typical customer is going to actually go and purchase the product? What kind of mm-hmm. ob- obstacles are they going to face? And how can we make this uh, purchasing you know, experience a very easy one and, 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 and a wonderful one for our customers? So I, I agree mm-hmm. with you. I, I think... This is all something that, uh, and how about the delivery? You didn't mention that. Well, right, like, um, yeah, if it's delivered e-commerce, you know, uh, what's going to be the cost? What kind of, yeah, what kind of size of package and so on? Yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah, acquisition also um, critical. This one, people tend to think about it because it's rather obvious, right? But they they often still make some, some mistakes. And also... Yeah, another angle to this is, do you want to avoid having your product copied very fast in China? You know, <laughs> if yes, then do not do Kickstarter, Indiegogo. Do not do a lot of like reviews by bloggers. Do not do anything that, you know, it's what, what people call like success theater. You know, you put it out there that your product is really successful and you, you try to show that it's a great product and people love it. Well, that's exactly what's going to prompt, you know, some companies in Shenzhen to to get a few samples, reverse engineer them, and put them on the market really fast and really cheap, right? Mm-hmm. So go brick and mortar <laughs> uh, for the first year, get some feedback, fine-tune your product, et cetera, et cetera. Then if you want to go big at one point, go big and, and make a big splash online and everything. But once you really have everything nicely figured out, and you know exactly how you're going to reach the, the, the right kind of customers and so on and so forth, right? And then it's going to be less harmful to you if you have cheap copycats uh, coming on the market, right? So that was block number three. Now, block number four is the product itself. And that's what most companies tend to focus the most on, you know, right? Okay, it's got to, to look and feel really nice. So we're going to work with an industrial designer. It's got to to do the, the right function the right way. So let's do some proof of concept prototypes and, and, and like refine the prototypes really nice. And it's got to have the performance, you know, like whatever, the, the fastest e-bike 
or the, the you know, um, <laughs> you, you, you get my meaning, right? And that's what people tend to focus the most on. But your product can be wonderful, but if nobody knows about it, if nobody even knows like where to buy it, um, if nobody can get responses to their questions, it's not going to matter because they, they're not going to buy it, right? There's not that many products that were so good that the market pulled it from them, you know, even though they completely overlooked the other blocks of the, of the customer journey, right? That's, that's really the main message of this podcast. Do you also see a lot of people tend to focus all of their time and energy on this? Like, let's get a prototype and then everybody will, um, <laughs> will try to, to get this product, right? Oh, yeah, actually, uh, you, you're, you, you, you're so right about that. Especially, I think this, is, um, this definitely applies for smaller companies that are basically, they, they have found a few great products in, uh, in China and they want to, um, you know, modify and, and perhaps sell it in another country for a better uh, pricing. And, and this happens all the time. Uh, they are focused only on the design UX and uh, and performance, and they totally forget about the fact that maybe even though it's from China, maybe so, and nobody in country knows about such a product. I remember mm. 20, 30 years ago, honestly, when I first went to uh, China, I saw JDI's toy drone. I do remember that very clearly. Mm. I had never seen a drone in my mm. life when I was in America. Mm. <laughs> so having seen that, it was almost like a little shock. Wow, how is this thing going and being so nicely controlled and, and flying everywhere? So I think mm. that you're, you're act, act absolutely right. I think it's very, very important that uh, as, a, as a product manufacturer, don't be just focused on these three things alone. You need to definitely inform your customer ahead of time by all means whatever it takes and educate in them and then show them show him what this product is all about it's not just an ordinary right. product and uh, what can what it can do yeah exactly exactly uh, and then once you buy your dji drone you need to see okay you need to do certain things right so that's the next block in the the buyer journey onboarding Right. So once you buy your DJI drone, what do you need to do? You need to have an app on your smartphone. So first, okay, you need to check, is my smartphone uh, supported for that, right? So that goes back to education, the earlier block. But then, so, okay, it's, it's, it's fine. And I'm just going to use my, my, my phone to, to control it. And okay, this is how I, I snap the phone inside and this is how I connect it all. And then they have onboarding videos on on how to how to set it up and then how to how to do a first flight and how to get it back to to base right to 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 the the place where it started to fly and um, and and they start with they even have a um like a i forget what they call it the the safe flight or something like that where they say well right. this is is not going to to go crazy uh, it's very easy to control you just press this button here, press this button there. It's very, very simple. And then people get to the, the wow factor much faster, right? They, they get, the, they get the, the photos and the videos like right there on their smartphone, uh, you know, from the camera of the drone. They see the drone is going left, right, up, down based on their commands and can go back safely to base. This is amazing. So DJI does a, does a relatively good job at that. Some other companies even better, like, Apple or Amazon, when you when you buy their hardware products, I forget which one. I think it's Amazon. They say um, frustration free packaging, right? Where <laughs> you 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 yeah, you just put it out, poop poop, but then that's it. It's very simple, um, and that's really what that, that's the bar now. That's where the bar is. That's the standard. That's the expectation from the market, right? So if you have a really good product, but you can never get it to work right like by the way a lot of these uh consumer electronic products 
you know, sold through AliExpress or something like that directly from China. Sometimes even the documentation is all in Chinese, right? I guess it got better over the years, but I remember a while ago, it was just terrible. Uh, and, and some people were saying, well, I'm very confused. I just can't get it to work, right? So that's the onboarding side. So uh, whenever the product is not extremely simple and intuitive, this is really a must, right? I, I totally agree with you. And, and there's another side of the onboarding is unboxing, right? Uh, there are a lot of these mm. influencer, influencers nowadays uh, um, mm. in YouTube that they are actually really, truly are influencing the the um, purchase of that product, mm. meaning that uh, they actually talk about, hey, look at this. I am opening this. They take a video. They show mm. one, two, three, you know, plug right. it in and boom, uh, plays right away. It uh, turns on right away and easy to find the functions and the buttons and so forth. This mm. really makes the customer who's viewing this unboxing experience uh, makes them feel like, wow, look at that beautiful product, beautiful packaging, yeah. easy to uh, install, for example, drivers if you need to or even don't need to. And, um, mm. you know, and, and the product uh, kind of does everything. All you got to do is one, two, three, quick start and ready mm. to go, and ready to use. I think these are very, very powerful things nowadays in the market. And, uh, you know, manufacturers need to be aware that the customers are really, really smart. Uh, customers have ways of educating themselves. And if they don't, as you mentioned, you know, they have high expectations of products uh, onboarding or unboxing. And if they don't feel uh, right when they're unboxing and onboarding, I think they could be disappointed and perhaps not purchase the product. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's where... Yeah, that's why they rave about it and they have the wow factor and that's where they, they kind of share about it. And that's that's how the other customers actually get to know about it. So it goes back to awareness, right? Okay, so the next step in the bio journey, once they've been onboarded and they understand how to use it, is they're actually going to use it over time, right, in their environment. And that goes right back to what we've been discussing several times here, reliability, durability, uh, also use, um, how to say, it, the ease of use over time, um, avoiding confusion and so on. Um, does it get some updates? So that's one of the, <laughs> the um, uh, how to say, that's one of the, the things that, that are really keeping a lot of Tesla uh, Tesla customers happy is that they get these updates over the air regularly, regularly, regularly. Uh, actually, a bit too fast sometimes. Uh, sometimes it, it, it impacts safety and they have to, to roll it back and, and so on. Whereas if you buy, for example, an, a, a, an OD um, electric vehicle, well, I mean, until recently at least, you bought it and then the software remained the same all throughout the life of that car, right? They never really thought of, okay, let's just keep it um, updated over the years, Tesla style. So because Tesla, you know, sort of comes from Silicon Valley and a lot of cool consumer electronics, and it's kind of obvious to them, but for a, uh, a traditional car manufacturer, it's not really that obvious, you know, whenever they had, I don't know, a CD player or something, in the car, well, it, 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 <laughs> that's it, you know, or, or, on the, or, all of the onboard electronics and I don't know how to move the, the, the rear, rear view mirror or anything like that, it doesn't change, right? And then they thought, well, once we go to electric vehicle and there's more and more and more software, it's fine, same idea, right? <laughs> well, big mistake because customer expectations were different, right? So. Um, I know we already discussed reliability a number of times, and I think last time was I can't remember. But we'll we'll put some some links in the show notes about some past pod, uh, podcast episodes about reliability and, and durability. Anything to add here about the, the usage? Uh, how how people can be happy when actually using the product? Well, I think you're right. Uh, we've mentioned it a lot because. 
you know, our company and our um, in, in our business, we pay a lot of attention to uh, reliability, durability, and safety and quality. But in, mm. but um, I think in this case, uh, as, as part of the uh, segments that we're discussing, I think it's important uh, for manufacturers to keep in mind that uh, what does the customer expect? And I think a good example would be like a mobile phone. You know, you, you pay $1,000 for a mobile phone, and if it drops from, say, half a meter, and all of a sudden the display cracks, I think that the customer expectation is going to be like, what? Are you kidding me? I paid $1,000 right. for this, and it just cracked in half a meter. So that is where the manufacturer needs to think, well, where is this customer expectation medium where you know, I can make them happy enough so that if they drop it and it breaks, they won't be blaming me. And in the, in the phone, mobile phone industry, uh, one meter drop, which is desk height, uh, is uh, the norm. Meaning that if it drops from one meter and if it doesn't break, that's wonderful. Customer is very happy. But if it drops over one meter, when the customer has the phone over their ear and they drop it, they won't, they, most of the time, they will not blame the, the manufacturer. Mm. So, so this is a very important reliability factor for manufacturers to keep in mind. Where is that happy medium where the customer is happy and how much should we make the product reliable? Because too much reliability can make the product clunky sometimes or make mm. it, uh, a little bit expensive in the price, right? Uh, we're, we're not trying to make a space age product, for example, right? So, mm -hmm. so that happy medium is something that our company, we are good at it. We know exactly how much reliability testing is required so that you don't have to spend a whole, whole lot of money, but then you need to make the customer happy. Yeah, and uh, yeah, what we found also is that for the exact same product, if it's sold in a certain positioning, uh, and at a certain price in certain distribution channels, the expectation would be different, yes. you know, versus another positioning, another price in another distribution channel. It's really, um, there's a bit of an art to it, right? And people need to uh, take a leap of, of, of faith sometimes. It's it's not always that uh, clear cut, right? But yeah, by looking at, let's say, similar products that are similarly priced, um that that makes sense. And sometimes you can just look at the competitors and say, okay, what do they exclude from the warranty? You know, well, like, do they set some kind of expectation right there? Okay, that's also a good a good starting point when 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 that can be found, right? So that's um that's usage, and that also brings us to the next phase, the, the the next stage in the, the buyer journey is support. You need support for your product. Well, okay, you get, as you say, you know, you dropped it, you cracked the display. Well, now you need, you know, you're not very happy about it. It's pretty ugly, but it's, you know, that, that phone is still relatively new. You want to have it fixed. And then if you, if you bring it to, um, to a repair center from the manufacturer, okay, it's, it's not easy to find. You need to drive to another city and so on and so forth. And then they make you wait for, for, for three hours. And then they say, well, oh, if you really want to fix it, it's going to be a thousand bucks. And you're like, but that's the cost of the new product. And they're like, yeah, sorry, but, you know, there's a lot of things to do here. And by the way, it's going to take three weeks. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to say, oh, scrap it. I'm going to change to, you know, a new phone. And maybe from another brand because you're not very happy, you know. So you go back to awareness and education. You know, what do the other brands with similar product do? And, oh, okay, these, these ones, they, um, they have a much better policy for that. And the pricing is much more reasonable because they enable the, I don't know, the independent repair shops and, and, um, and, and there's spare parts easy to, to, to get. And, and it, it, yeah, it's much cheaper. Okay, then I'm going to go with these guys because I'm, I'm done with that big brand. That, that just messed things up, right? And yeah, in, in the book, they also mention, uh, you know, troubleshooting, 
knowledge base, call center, community, right? There's a lot of ways that it can be uh, can be used for support, right? Well, I think the call center is a really uh, interesting experience for people who have issues and they need to call the customer center service. And um, mm-hmm. not only they have to wait a long time, most often, of course, depends on the product that they have. Most often they'll be mm-hmm. transferred to another country, uh, someone who barely speaks English. And then you, you, you're mm-hmm. trying to explain your problem. They misunderstand it and they transfer you to somewhere else. And then you have to wait a long mm-hmm. time to be transferred. And all of a sudden, somewhere in between the transfer, then the call drops. Now you have to call. Now somebody yeah. else picks up. Right. Now you have to repeat everything. Then they try to transfer you. And then the, the other guy who picks it up completely got it wrong. <laughs> yeah, right. That There was a lot of talk about maybe 15 years ago about Dell Hell, right? So Dell <laughs> for their, uh, their laptops and their computers in general. They, I think they really tried to save money on the, the, the customer support and they had people call these these call centers, and I think the, the their KPI was like you know how long you can get the customer um, engaged, like the shorter the better, right? With a target of just get the customer off and and done, right? So you you might say, well, yeah, that that pushes them to to be really good at solving the customer's problem, right? But actually, what happened is that okay, the call centers got really good at just kicking the customers away, uh, you know, without actually providing any value. <laughs> so that yes. if you, if you still Google Dell Hell, you you will um, you will find some right. And yes. and then finally, the last stage is loyalty. How do you keep these same customers engaged? You know, sort of with your brand or you know, with with, with your company. So, do you tell them about new products how do they learn about new products do you actually get their email address right so that's really a very important thing if you can sell through your website you can collect the email address if you sell through home depot or, or you know lower merlin or whatever uh cortes inglés or whatever kind of brick and mortar shops are you going to get the email address usually not Right. So how do you actually keep them updated about your new products, about your promotions, about things like that? Right. That's really something to to keep in mind. Uh, Amazon also, I believe, does not provide you with the email addresses of the customer, I believe. So anyway, that's really something to, to, to look at. Right. And then, yeah, they're going to be happy and happy. They're going to leave some ratings. They're going to leave some reviews. Um is there anything you can do to give a little bit of, um, you know, again, a wow factor, right, with the product itself or little attentions that go a long way? And that reminds me that uh, Nest, so the, the smart thermostat for uh, keeping the home at the right temperature, you know, at the right time of the day. So you don't, you don't, you, you don't overconsume um, electricity, uh, when you're actually not at home, et cetera, et cetera. It's a smart product, right? But they included a small uh, screwdriver or something similar to that. <clears throat> uh, small, cute, uh, very handy, right? Uh, and that was for the onboarding phase of the, the buyer journey. So that is very easy for them to set it up, all right? But then they noticed a lot of people really happy about the Nest screwdriver and then they would keep that screwdriver because it's convenient for other stuff around the house. And they, they thought, hey, this pushes our cost of goods sold a little bit you know, higher up, maybe one or two dollars US. So again, it's a, it's a small piece of metal, right? But let's, let's keep it there because actually we get much better reviews. It, gets, it gives people the impression that really we, we, we care, right? It's a little attention that um, it's, it's a relatively easy win. Let's keep it there, right? And that makes a lot of sense. So the question is, how can you do that with your product to, to give a sweet, uh, a sweet taste, basically, <laughs> right? When, when people are using your product. Uh, do, do you have some, some other uh, examples that come to your mind? Or? 
Yeah, I, I did want to make a couple of comments that I I think you kind of pointed to it already. Well, this section, you know, loyalty is all about customer loyalty, right? And I think that when it comes to customer, we probably have at least two kinds of customers, right? One, they're loyal already and they already buy in. And they always buy our products, just like people who buy nothing but Apple products, right? We know that. Mm-hmm. And um, there is not much we need to do with those customers. All we need to do, keep them informed, keep them in the loop and uh, let them know what else new is coming and how much we appreciate their business, right? But the tough thing is how are we going to grow the business without bringing more new customers? This is where the hard part is. This is where the the challenge is. And I think this is where when you get a new customer, especially the one that uh, is not knowledgeable about your product, and so he's complaining, you know, I, I got this and I don't even know how to turn on. It doesn't work. This thing just is a mess. The reason is because he doesn't know your product. Let's say someone who trans, I think Apple product could be a good one. Let's say someone who was an Android user mm-hmm. all of a sudden is moving to Apple and now he's complaining. I can't even do a screenshot, for example, on this. I don't know how to, uh, you know, bookmark what is this this is a terrible product so well you know <laughs> up until recently where you could find all that information in youtube you you couldn't do that right before you had to call the customer service and say well i can't find this information in the user manual how do i do this and this is the great opportunity where the customer service will win this customer and the customer will start thinking, wow, great answer, great response. I'm very happy. Every time I call them, they answer. And next thing you know, they'll start learning more and more about the product and they'll become the new loyal customer. And this mm-hmm. is how the business right. grows. Then the next one that I think a lot of companies, at least I think um, in the last maybe 10 years, it's becoming a norm. But before that, no one even knew anything about uh, rating and reviews, right? Um, but now it's mainstream and it's very, very important for listening the customer response. Of course, we all know that some of those ratings and reviews are not quite exactly, you know, real and it should be. But uh, but most are real and most customers do respond and reply with uh, either frustration and or with great reviews about the product and, and and the manufacturers need to, I think, listen. Yeah, no, absolutely, absolutely. Actually, every one of these stages that we went through, if they if they are done right, will tend to, yeah, to generate better ratings, better reviews, uh, and and more loyalty, right? But you need to, yeah. The, the last phase was really how to actually keep the people loyal. It's it's really a um, you know for repeat business basically. The idea is that they how to pull them back to your next new product, right? So I think we've been through uh, the, the, the whole, um, you know, buyer journey uh, kind of concept. And uh, well, I hope it was, it was useful. The, the key, key idea, again, just to reiterate, is that if you just think of your new product itself, what it does, how it looks like, and so on, how it feels in the hand or, or whatever, That's very important, obviously, but it's not just about having the best product. There's all other things out there that are so important. And in different product categories, the the mix, you know, would be a bit different. Uh, What what would matter would be a bit bit different, right? For example, for cars, yeah, if if a car brand has the wrong, you know, has a reputation for, poor reliability or poor safety, wow, that would kill a lot of sales, right? And, and, and in different, uh, different types of products, uh, different factors will be weighted differently. So, yeah, we, we're, we've been through the, 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 the whole journey. So, and by the way, if you want to support our podcast, you can give us a, a five-star review, a little comment. We're always happy about it. I know it's easy to do in Apple Podcasts, uh, on other platforms. Uh, it depends, but usually there's a way to uh, to give a thumbs up or five star or something like that. 
All right. Thanks a lot for, for listening in. Uh, thanks a lot, Andrew. It was nice to, to have you on. And You're welcome. We'll, and we'll be back uh, next week. All right. Thanks a lot. Thanks again for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Sophies Group. We're on a mission to provide you with everything you need to manufacture effectively in Asia, including inspections, auditing, new product development support, contract manufacturing, 3PL warehousing and fulfillment, and much, much more across Asia's key manufacturing areas. Visit us at sofeast.com, that's S-O-F-E-A-S-T dot com, to learn more and get help. If you've enjoyed the podcast today, please do rate, review and share because it will really help others discover us too.